pleasure to introduce today's distinguished lecturer, Saul Greenberg. Saul has a long and a illustrious career within the field of human computer interaction. He holds the i Corps and NSERC Smart Technologies Industrial Chair in Interactive Technologies at the University of Calgary. And in 2005, he was elected to the ACM Chi Academy for its overall contributions to the field of human computer interaction. Uh, as you might imagine, this is a very distinguished honor to hold in our uh, community. Saul is a prolific author who has authored and edited several books, including a new book coming out Oop. this year. That's your cue. That's my cue. Hang on. I forgot All about right. it. There. Sketching new experiences coming out in January. Um, so I know that my uh, students have really liked kind of like the, the precursor to this sketching user experience. So we're really looking uh, forward to seeing this book. Um, he has also, of course, authored more refereed articles than I'd care to count. Um, Saul's research focuses on tools and toolkits for interactive systems. Among the many systems he's built, uh, he created and commercialized fidgets. Uh, and this is a system that makes it really easy to prototype new forms of interactive hardware. Uh, recently, we just got a bunch of these fidgets, and, and we use them in our lab and in our classes so that students can uh, quickly prototype new forms of computers for computing devices. Saul's approach to research is very similar to his approach to life, which is best uh, conveyed perhaps by describing an experience I had when I visit, visited him several, several years ago. You're going to embarrass me, aren't you? No, okay, no. I know how these things go. <laughs> so, so when I went out to visit him, the cold winter just set in, and we went out to go ice skating one afternoon. Now, when most of you think of ice, ice skating, you think of going to a nearby rink. With Saul, we drove out to a secluded spot in the Rockies known only to the locals. We had to hike to the spot. Uh, so in addition to our skates, Saul had a bottle of, I, I think it was bear spray, was mm. it, attached to his belt, along with ice screws and ropes, should any of us fall through the ice of the frozen lake. Um, this was not your typical trip to the local ice rink, but it's classic Saul. And the reward was being able to skate on crystal clear ice where we could see fish swimming below our skates. And this really is where the similarity to Saul's research comes in. It's fresh, it's exciting, and it's extremely rewarding. So please join me in welcoming Saul. So what, what Mike neglected to mention is that I borrowed some skates for him, and it turned out that they were about three and a half sizes too small. So he was stumbling along. The, the, he, he put the skates on, and he lasted about 10 minutes. And then he had to sit, sit on the sidelines while all of us spent the next hour and a half skating, having a great time. And he was freezing his butt. So sorry about that. And, uh, and he didn't fall in? Nope. Good, he's here today. <laughs> So I'm delighted to be here at, at Waterloo, um, and, I, I, and I really do want to thank you and for the, to the department for hosting me for this visit. Um, it's it's just, just great being here. And, and I don't know if you know this, uh, sometimes the people inside a university don't realize the, the, the strengths of it, but you have a really good uh, human-computer interaction group in this department, plus also in other associated departments with like uh, Mark Hancock over there and Stacy Scott and other things. There's a, it's really become this nice thriving area, um, which is built upon uh, previous strengths as well. So it's, uh, like it's, it's great to see this. So for those of you who don't know me, like uh, I think you're right. Uh, so I'm from Alberta, Canada, and I live in the heart of the Rocky Mountains. And this is actually a slope, like literally within sight of my house. Uh, I'm an outdoor enthusiast. I probably spend my time mountain biking and scrambling and backcountry skiing. And when I can't do that, I work at the University of Calgary. Uh, and I commute into there. And I spend, there I spend my time doing the usual prof thing. I teach and I do research in, quite, in many, many areas of human-computer interaction. I'm a bit, a bit of a dilettante in that. Now, at a seminar such as this, you know, addressed to, I think, this is a fairly broad audience in, so that's comprising mostly computer scientists or people in related areas, um, I believe it's best to have you imagine what could be sto in store for us in the future as opposed to me revisiting established work that I did like 20 years ago, like fidgets, that was, oh, that was so like 10 years ago, it's, uh, <laughs> or 12 years ago now, but, or, or even the stuff before. Um, so for today, I'm going to highlight a fairly recent research interest of mine that I call proxemic interactions. And I actually wrote about this in, uh, in an ACM Interactions cover story earlier this year. So if you actually want to see a written summary of what you have today, that this is the article you can go to. And, and I should warn you that 
my talk is intended to raise more questions and provoke thought about what could be rather than to solve or produce definitive answers. I'm not going to have all the answers for you. This is kind of a new area for us. We've been working in a few years. And as part of the work, um, I think the value of it is, is actually looking at all the challenges that come up not only in human computer interaction, but to the fundamentals of, of computer science, how computer science can contribute to a new area. And I'll return to this somewhat near the end of this talk. But to think about the future, we have to also think about the history of human computer interaction, which kind of mirrored my own particular research interests. So when I first started, and this is like 1979, I guess, in computer science, um, uh, computer science was all about designing computer systems. And you know we're really good, and most of undergrads, for example, are re really become good at making the computer dance. We know how the thing works. We know how to program it. We know how to make it do exactly what we want. And to a large extent, much of computer science is still like that. Um, but I was fortunate enough in around, I think it was 1981, to attend the very first ACM CHI conference, which was the first conference on human factors in computing systems. And where I and, of course, others realized that it was the interaction between the person and the computer that created the system. So we can still have the system's point of view, but it wasn't just about the computer. It wasn't about the box. It was about the person as a fundamental part of the system. And that's how user-centered design came about. And that also became my focus as well as the focus of people at human computer interaction. But that wasn't enough, good enough because in the late 1980s, the field of computer-supported cooperative work emerged. And this is where the view of the system grew to include multiple people working together via computers. That is, the computer became the medium for communication and for joint work. And, and for gaming and for other things. And this broader view kept my interest for well over a decade. And you know, I, I think around Canada, sometimes people call me Mr. CSCW because they see me anchored to this stuff about group wear and all this other things. And um, which is, in, in a way, is, is, is kind of true. But technology has changed. And so did the idea of what is a computer. So we have, every, how many of you have this? Right, uh, an iPhone, a playbook, like let's see how many hands, so how many, yeah, pretty well, almost everybody in this place. Um, this is now, a, a, it not only becomes another computer, but it actually becomes for many the primary computer by which we interact with, with our world. Our desktops, for many people, are becoming the secondary computer. So, and this is really where ubiquitous computing arose. And all of a sudden, the community wasn't just looking at how people work together through a computer, but they were looking at how multiple pe people interact with multiple technologies in a seamless manner, manner. And this is a real challenge. Like, we now have desktop computers, PDAs, laptops, various forms of pads, smartphones, informational appliances, and, and, and on and on and on. But there's still more, because that wasn't a complete picture because it didn't really include people's everyday environment. And this is this whole idea of what's called embodied interaction. And, and an embodied interaction situates technology and interaction in the real world context to facilitate natural social practice. It, it kind of takes, it kind of, it's not just about our, our stuff, our technology and ourselves, but it's also about where are we? What's our context? What, what's the, our usual practice in that place? What are our routines? And my presentation today is, uh, fits within this for, I'm going to actually describe how we can take social theory, this thing called proxemics, and apply it to interaction design and to computer science more generally. And the idea is to help a person mediate their everyday interactions with other people and a myriad of other technologies. Now, I have to do the usual caveat. Um, who here is not a prof or a student? OK, just one. What are you? Two. Okay, well, good. Well, you're close enough. You know, you're polluted. Um, as all of you know, profs spend a lot of time being research managers. And, and, and I really want to emphasize that the, a lot of the work I'm going to show you today was done by a lot of people in my lab. Uh, this goes from, from faculty like Hideaki Kuzuoka from Japan, who visited for years. Um, uh, Nick, Nick uh, Markard is now my current PhD student, and Till Ballendot, they're really instrumental in all the work you're going to see, and um, without them, none of this would, would be here. A former alumni of, you, of yours, uh, Richard Fung, who's, who's now in our lab, and, and a host of other graduate students. So please think of me as their messenger, not as the one who did all this, okay? And I'm going to actually show their pictures again during the talk, but you know, like the, the grad students, you guys, 
for most of you, like, you know, us pros need to bow down to you because you're really doing all the great stuff. And, we, and much of our time, we're, we're just letting it, we're, we're kind of giving you an environment to make it happen, but, but you guys are great. And my guys are great. And I just want you to remember that it's my guys who are really behind this, except for when it goes bad. That's my fault. OK. OK. So let, let's uh, go, go, go back to, to what this talk is about. So we have this idea of ubiquitous computing, or ubicomp. And this really envisages an ecology of devices. Now, the problem is, and I'm sure all of you have experienced that, is that it's really incredibly difficult to interconnect and use these devices in an integrated manner. Like, sure, we have little applications, but you know, if we got three things together and said, OK, let's connect, let's actually do some exchange stuff, it'd be pretty painful. In fact, most, most of us don't bother. So I want you to imagine a new kind of Ubicomp, a new kind of ubiquitous computing. Imagine if we had an ecology of devices with knowledge of proxemics. And proxemics here, I mean things like the distance between devices, the way one device is oriented toward another, the identity of devices. That this is stuff every device knows. And it knows that of nearby devices and nearby people, and perhaps even of non-digital objects. So in the sketch, for example, we see people who are carrying digital devices moving in and out of room with a large digital surface. And as part of this, we can ask, what could we do if, for example, that surface, that touch surface, knew exactly who and where people were in a room? How could we ease the connection and information exchange between the surface and people's devices, like this, this iPhone I'm carrying, or playbooks that some of you are carrying, um, or between devices and the various informational appliances in the room? And more importantly, how can we exploit this knowledge to design natural user interfaces that promote embodied interaction? That is, where it recognizes our actual situation and what we do. And what I'm really talking about here is exploiting social sciences as a method to drive the design of interactive systems, where we're kind of taking advantage of people's natural expectations of spatial relationships. And, and I'm going to explain this a little bit. So here's my sociology 101. And we're going to start in the 1960s, where there is an anthropologist, Edward Hall, and he defined this notion of proxemics. And proxemics really is, is uh, people's cultural perspectives of space. And in particular, Hall was interested in how people manage their interpersonal space, their proximity from one another. Now, he came out with a variety of statements. And in, and in part particular, the one that most people associate with him is that it correlates physical distance to social distance. And this is something we all know tacitly, especially uh, when it's violated. So for example, here I'm in a, what's called a public space. So there's a certain distance between me and the audience, and that's normal. Now, some, you may have noticed that some of your profs, if they want to engage some of the people in the back of the room, they may walk through the aisles. They may get closer to you. They may make eye contact with you. Or you know, the folks in the back, if I really want to get that guy with the red shirt, I may kind of wave to him, or I'll walk toward him. I may even go, go over there. Um, and in fact, in performers will play with this notion of space to try to get you involved. Because as soon as you do that, you know, I notice that, oh, these guys, maybe he's going to look at me, so there's more eye contact happening. It's like, oh, he's getting close. Because that's something we expect. Now, that space thing is kind of, you know, that's sort of, I'm playing with it, but I can also violate it. So I never met this guy, and I can spend my time now looking at him. And now I'm going to really embarrass you, because now he's like, oh, you can't turn away from me, can you? It's really hard. <laughs> it's really hard, because now I'm in a different kind of space. This is a space where we're supposed to be conversing. And you know, I can get really close to you, <laughs> and it's really uncomfortable. It's, uh, well, it wasn't for me. Was it OK for you? It's OK. <laughs> Uh, so this whole idea is stuff that we know, and we live every, every moment with it. And you know, just um, co coincidentally, uh, this was in the Globe and Mail yesterday. And the caption is, um, let me see if I can read it. I took it with my, my phone. Uh, head to head again and again, a Palestinian argues with an Israeli soldier in 2007. And you can see, and this is, so they decided to recycle this photo because you can see this incredible uh, image of here is this person in this face of, of the soldier, obviously in a confrontational kind of situation, and this person trying to be, be unusually calm about it. And we know by looking at that that there is some social thing going on here that really highlights the tension of the situation. So, um, and we also know that you know, there's people that we sometimes talk to, they're kind of in our space and we back away from them. So like this always happens, right? So let's get back to Hall. 
Um, he can talk about what he described more formally. He, he considered things as a series of zones around people. Now, starting from the inside, we have this intimate zone, and we see up here these two lovers, and you know, they're obviously intimate, and sorry, what's your name? Darren. Darren. I was intimate with Darren. Darren really didn't want me to be intimate with him. And it was uncomfortable because that is really the space normally reserved for people who are incredibly close to, uh, to each other. Um, and this is really a very small distance. And then as you start stepping back, we have what's called a personal zone, which is where close friends and colleagues are situated relative to one another as they converse. And this wonderful statue, which is in downtown Calgary, kind of shows that, where here's these two guys in this kind of very close conversation. They're actually reaching out to touch each other. So it's kind of like they're in their personal space, but there's also a little bit of intimacy in there as well. And as you back out again, we have the social zone, and this is where acquaintances usually sit. And here we see, the, again, a great picture. I love this. The two girls are in their personal zone. The two guys are in the personal zone. But the guys are, and, and girls are in each other's social zone. And the guys really want to get in the girls' personal zone. <laughs> or maybe it's the other way around, but you know, that's the way it is. Now, um, you know, it's, it's again just shows the, this illustration. And we have that sometimes, and you all know this, that when somebody you don't really know gets too close and you don't want them to be. And uh, so again, there's that violation aspect of it. And finally, we have this public zone and that's reserved for things where strangers occupy a space. And like, for example, a public pre presentation such as this. And, uh, and I've actually shown you how I could play with that. But real life isn't that simple. Like we all, and because of that, we all have defense mechanisms. Like so, for example, the way we use gaze, the way we uh, we use um, our posture, the way we use our body language, uh, and all this kind of tries to mediate interaction. So, for example, when fir people first came into this room, it was sparsely populated. So people would normally, unless they were friends, they would normally leave a seat in between themselves and the person next to them. As it started to fill out. People didn't have that option, so we're actually in each other's space. But if you actually look at the postures of people around you, like there you are, you know, your arms are there, your arms are inside your body, or your arms are in front of you on your desk. You know, we don't do this. We kind of become inward a bit more. Um, if you're, and we don't, we rarely go sideways. Like if all of a sudden, if you were to sit and look at him, he would think that would be pretty weird. Okay, well maybe. Um, I don't know you guys, so maybe it's not weird, but, it, but, it, but you, you get the point. There's things that we do. If we're in a tightly packed elevator, we hold our arms together, we tense our muscles when people touch each other, we have taboos about touch. And all these are part of the ways uh, we regulate the social behavior. Um, but in spite of that, you know, the spatial distance is still a reasonable first approximation of social distance. And, uh, and the question is, can we actually do something about that? Um, now, before I leave Hall, I just wanted to mention that he had two other primary notions. Uh, one was this idea of a fixed feature, and these are, um, I'm going to describe these more as boundaries and territories, or things that are movable in, in, in an area that kind of defines a bit of context around it. So for example, an entranceway to a room could be considered a fixed feature because the meaning of that changes the social dynamics of that area. There's also this idea of a semi-fixed feature, and these are things that you can move around that can adjust the sense of spatial separation or social distance. So for example, if I take two chairs like this, if I arrange two chairs side by side, that's very different when I have them the same distance apart but facing each other. And we all know that we've sometimes been in restaurants or living rooms where chairs, the arrangements of chairs can make a difference between how social or not that, uh, that um, y your evening was. So the question from an interface design perspective is this. How can we apply the theory of proxemics in desi to design, that is, to proxemic interactions? And this is what my work is all about. Now, this is where Dan comes in. Dan, can you stand up? Dan Vogel, who's here as a postdoc, is, is currently my god. Uh, you know, D Dan, Dan and Ravan Bala uh, Krishnan in 2004, and by the way, this is part of my permanent slide deck. I didn't just throw this in because you're here. Um, in 2004, did a beautiful job of, of what I consider to be a seminal work of applying proxemics to design, where he looked at how we can have a large display, a touch sensitive display, that actually altered its behavior as people approached it. And he specifically looked at, at different zones around the display, trying to directly apply that theory. And, and I have to say that, that is what you did, eh? 
you kind of say, well, yes. wait a second, is that what he did? <laughs> um, and uh, I have to say that when I first saw that work, and he has a wonderful video of it that you should all see, um, that stayed in my mind for years and years and years. And it was only finally a couple of years ago that I said, I now have time and the desire to actually do it. So, and Dan was really, you, you, you were my inspiration for that. So thank you. And it, it's great that that's happened. Anyway, so other people have done this before. It's not just Dan, there's a few others, but I just want to mention that. So actually, I did use proximity earlier. And this is, I'm going to show you my own first efforts that began in 1999. And we were just kind of dabbling. We were actually more interested in awareness, but it turned out we were using proximity. So this fellow Hideaki Kuzoka and I, built an always-on video-based media space augmented by physical devices, which were, in, in reality, my kids' toys that I stole from them. Um, and I'm going to show you a video of how we use proximity. So in the first part, uh, you're going to see how we use physical devices to provide awareness of people who are somewhere at a distance to somehow bring them closer together. And it's really a simple setup. And the second part, is going to, I'm going to show you how we can use physical sensors uh, that measure proximity to mediate privacy con concerns or privacy factors in an always-on uh, video, um, video setting. So um, let me show you that. And, and we'll I'll see what it's like keeping the lights on. OK. <coughs> Is it playing? No. Wait, sorry. I've got to do. Hmm. We're really to talk to the about the Oh, well. I'll get something similar to that. Oh, he is back. Yeah, he's all here. Let's not need to talk to him. I want to talk to him about the article. OK, see you there right away. Bye. No, grab my book. Oh, and I see he's left too, so it's time to go. What we're seeing now is what we call the active hybrid unit, based upon the work that Bill Buxton did. And this, uh, this brings together a video, audio, a microphone unit, along with uh, proximity sensors. So right now, we're together close by each other, so we can speak. The cats aren't moving away. To preserve privacy, audio is turned off automatically. So we can't hear Giddy Acne anymore. And if I move even further away, it goes into what we call a glimpse mode, where I get only occasional glimpses into his offices. Again, this is a privacy feature that lets me know who's around, but try to only give a limited view to the space. So now we're back together again. So this was a pretty crude system, and uh, you know it's based on analog technology. But there, the idea is that we try to mimic everyday life, where if we're close by, we can see and hear, and as you move further back, you get to see less, and you get to hear less, and so on. Um, because it was analog, we really had only the ability to switch it on and off, not to to modulate it. Um, but when we returned to this more recently. Uh, like within the last couple of years, we decided to tackle, why we, I mean myself, my students, decided to tackle proximity as a first class research project. And one of the computer science type questions we had to, to answer was how to operationalize the social notion of proxemics as metrics that we could capture from our environment. So this is really the computer science question of how do we do our sensing, how do we actually get that information, how do we interpret it. And the result that we started with was five dimensions. And this is kind of our starting point. So the first is the distance between objects. And that's kind of like you've seen that in the basic fundamentals of proxemics. The second is the relative orientation of one object to another. So even though the distance is the same, the way I hold something and, and orient it can affect a notion of proxemics. The third is movement. So am I moving toward or away for, from something? And how fast? Because that also has an effect. The fourth is identity. So what is the actual thing, things that are moving, uh, that are in relationship to one another? And finally, this idea of location, which is really context. What do I know about the environment, and how can I use that to interpret all these other factors? Now, uh, based on that, we, this is where the kind of the toolkit side of me comes in. Um, we create a platform that could capture all that information, and an API that would let us rapidly program proxemics interactions. Um, what we found over and over and over again in our group is that if you take the time to build a toolkit that will let you rapidly prototype your systems, 
the stuff you can experiment with and get out is, is just fantastic and uh, the productivity of the group as a whole explodes, uh, explodes in a good way. So it's a worthwhile thing that we do. Um, so our proximity toolkit is based on both a high-end motion capturing system but also the Connect system working together. Um, and it captures those five dimensions, uh, things like uh, position, orientation, identity, movement, location. And from that, we derive higher level data, things like touch. Touch is just distance zeros. Uh, the relationships of what is the relationship of one object to another. Things like ray casting. If, two, if one thing is oriented toward another and we had um, a center point where it does inter intersect with the screen and so on. Uh, and also this idea of collisions and a host of other things. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just show you a little video of the toolkit. Uh, just to give you a sense from programs perspectives of the kind of tools that they can have and hopefully you'll see that this is a very rich environment. Developer Steve plans to build a proximic aware public announcement board that considers the presence of nearby people and devices. To begin his exploration, he starts the toolkit server component. The server integrates different tracking systems using a plugin architecture. A depth sensing camera provides tracking information about people. And an infrared marker based system tracks devices and objects. The visual monitoring tool immediately visualizes the tracked entities, in this case a person and a tablet computer. The tool shows an overview list of all currently tracked entities. The center displays a 3D representation of the tracked space. Next, Steve selects two entities, the person and the display, to observe relationships between them. He selects the proxemic relationships he wishes to monitor, for example, orientation, distance, or pointing. The toolkit also makes the proxemic information accessible through an event-driven API. Steve creates a new UBCOM application by using the provided development template and adding a few lines of code to his program. First, he initializes the three entities he's interested in. Second, he creates event handlers to monitor relationships between them. Third, he adds callback methods that are called when the system recognizes changes in any of the monitored relationships. This completes the minimum code necessary to already monitor proxemic relationships within the application. Steve then refines his first prototype. The application gets activated when a person enters the space. It uses the distance between the person and the board to adapt the displayed content and allows a person to seamlessly add new messages to the board when touching the tablet to the board. So, um, you know, I hope you get a sense of that, that um, the programmer in this case first has a visual environment so that they can actually get a feel for the social dynamics of what does it mean to actually get close, bring, get close to something or bring one device close to another. And from that, they can then go into the code to, usually within a few lines, to actually set up these relationships between entities. Um, the, the important point of this is that they don't have to do any of the sensing stuff. Uh, in fact, it's like this, the, the fact that they're using Vicons and Connects is totally transparent. They're just dealing with data. Um, they're using familiar programming paradigms to, to, to program these things. They don't have to do any of the low level uh, plumbing. Almost all their attention can be paid to, can I get the information, can I act on it? And from an interaction design perspective, that's where, where you want to be. Um, let's see. Oh, so, uh, so one of the first applications we built, almost as j just for fun, was to actually just create a social actor on a large screen and have it react to people. So this, uh, I'm going to show you something called the Vicon face, and this is really just a set of really simple rules where this face will animate itself based upon things like distance orientation and other things. So let's take a look. We demonstrate many of these attributes with the Vicon face application. Using position, the eyes follow the moving hat and wand. Using orientation, the face becomes sad when the hat is pointed away and happy when it points back again. <laughs> Using distance, the mouth exaggerates its existing expression to a point where it becomes angry. Using velocity, the face is surprised by oh, sudden motions of the hat and is fearful of sudden motions of the wand. <laughs> Using pointing, the wand acts as a flashlight that can interact with the face. Using touch, the face Ow. becomes angry when it is poked in the eye. 
Who says research can't be fun? Um, you know, one of the things, like this is just a toy little application, but one of the things is that when we bring people in our lab, you know, people have no computer science background whatsoever. They get in front of it and they totally get it because it's something that they know. And, um, and I think it's just as an illustration that if you do this, even in this cartoonish-like thing, people will, will immediately understand what's happening and will be able to, 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 um, uh, to interact with the system. So now that we have this toolkit, we, we then began to experiment with this idea of a proximity ecology. And our, actual, our own test bed mirrors uh, pretty well what, exactly what you see here. We had a simulated home living room with a large touch sensitive smart board. And we developed as our, as our demo application a digital media or a video player that ran on the surface. Um, and, and we used that to just experiment with, uh, with developing interaction techniques and also to uh, uncover any issues. So what I'm going to do, uh, and I want to stress that the video player that you're going to see is strictly a test bed. Our, our goal is not to develop the next generation video player. It's just a way to say, well, let's actually look at a few issues here and see where things seem to work or where they fail. And I'm actually going to show you a bunch of clips of, a, of a, or scenes from ecology and also how this proxemic media player reacts to proxemics of people and devices. Um, and on the way, I want you to look for not only what you think, oh yeah, that makes sense, but also look for where, you th you, where the parts where you say, hey, wait a minute, why did it do that? And I don't like that idea. Because like any two technologies, I think you get more benefits by looking at the failures or the issues that are raised rather than just the successes. So we're going to start by showing how the surface just reacts to, to a person, how they enter this room, how they approach the display, how they touch it, and then how they watch, watch a video on it. We illustrate these concepts through a scenario using our proxemic media player application. The application reacts to a person's presence, distance, and orientation to the display. When a person enters the room, the application starts. As they approach the display, more content of the video collection is continuously revealed. People can explore and select videos through direct touch when standing in close proximity to the display. When taking a seat, the player implicitly switches to full screen view. So there's actually a lot going on in that short scene. Um, this idea of things turning on when it detects presence. The idea that from a distance you get to see kind of an overview that's appropriate at a distance, but as you more, move closer you get to see more detail. And also the way the interaction techniques are tuned to where you are in the space. In this case, when the person was within arm's reach, the interaction, the kind of controls were appropriate for, for touch. And you'll see later how when they're more of a distance it'll be more appropriate for ray casting. Um, the use of the, the, fixed, uh, the fixed features of Hall. So this, the distance actually from entering a room is the same as the distance from sitting on a couch. But, this, but the actual area is different, so it actually, the, the action it does differs as well. Um, so a lot going on in that little scene. Um, so in the next clip, uh, I want to show you how the surface reacts. Uh, so actually, Dan Vogel did a lot of that kind of stuff. Uh, the only difference, I think, between this and what you did was that our stuff is continuous rather than discrete. So it, it kind of continuously reacts to a person's presence. Um, but now we start thinking about this ecology, because it's not just me and a screen, but it's me holding a cell phone or something. So in this little clip, we're going to see how the system also pays attention to how our handheld devices are held in relationship to, to us and what we actually, and how it infers intent from it. So uh, let's, let's take a look at this clip here. Proxemic interactions also consider a person's relationship to nearby objects. The video playback is paused during implicit actions, such as when the person answers a phone call or when turning away to read a magazine. Okay, so, so um, okay, first issue. What, what, what do people just see here that they don't like? Yeah? If they're turning away, maybe something about the video has lost their attention. And so maybe they don't want to pause it. Maybe they want mm -hmm. to keep going. Absolutely, or maybe they're looking at their TV guide, or maybe they actually don't want it to pause. Like, like here we actually get into the issue of like, like, like what's the rules of behavior, and when we actually try to infer intent, sometimes we'll get it right, but a lot of times we're also going to get it wrong. So there, there's this whole thing which I'll touch upon later about the whole rules of behavior behind such, uh, such systems, and that's a big design challenge. Um, 
one thing that was happening technically earlier is that when the person held the phone to the head, it, the actual system was tracking the fact that the phone was actually next to the person's head. It was looking at the collision between the phone and the person's head. So that was being tracked and that was being used to drive what was happening on the display. Um, so now we're also going to see how we can take that exact same object, in this case a cell phone, and simply by changing a little bit of its distance, but mostly about its orientation, how we can give it a totally different function. So let's take a look at this one. A person pointing an object to the screen, like a phone, triggers explicit interactions, such as selecting videos from a distance. So again, it's the same thing. The meaning of this held here is different from the meaning of that held out there. And also the interface altered itself to make itself more appropriate for ray casting. That is larger targets, just a few of them, that you could easily uh, get quickly. So again, we're modifying the kinds of interaction you can do as a function of proximity. Um, then we have not just multiple devices, but we have multiple people. And in this next clip, we're going to see how the, the interaction changes yet again to try to recon recognize multiple people in the space and do something appropriate. Next, we illustrate proximity interactions of multiple people. When a second person enters the room, a video title appears to provide awareness about the ongoing playback. When approaching the screen, further information about the current video becomes visible. This information is placed on the screen in a way that allows the person sitting to continue watching the video. When including the sitting person's view, the person in front of the display gets control over the video selection. The two views merge when both sit down to watch the video. The video is paused during conversations when both people face away from the screen. Again, a non-digital object is used to select videos from a distance. This time, the person uses a pen. So again, we see. The oh, sorry. Turns off when Forgot about that. Has left the room. So again, we see the kinds of information displayed as a function of the multiple people where they are, um, and it's different from just one person being in a space. Uh, we see some, some stuff where we can also question. So for example, this idea of if I block the display from you, I get a different set, of, and I'm close by, I get a different set of controls. That may work for adults, but I think with my kids, with young kids, it would be a disaster, right? It's, uh, but you know, again, what are the rules of, of behavior in these, these, these settings? Um, we're also now going to talk about uh, how we can take a digital device and use that to initiate network connectivity and actually information exchange uh, with, with another device, in this case, the, the large display. So let's take a look at this one here. Proximic interactions also consider the distance and orientation of other digital devices around the surface in order to facilitate device-to-device -device interaction. We illustrate this using a media sharing functionality between a portable digital media device and the large surface. The system provides awareness information regarding sharing possibilities <coughs> of the devices at a distance. An icon representing the portable device on the large screen changes its position and size depending on the orientation and distance of the portable device to the screen. Full access and information exchange is possible once the person brings the device close to the screen. So this whole idea of using proximity and orientation as a way to promote uh, awareness of, look, here's opportunities to connect and to actually, as you approach things, you actually do more reveal. Here's a discovery of what you can do to the point where you can actually do transfer. Very, very different from dealing with dialog boxes and trying to set up Bluetooth and trying to find folders here and folders there and all the other stuff. Um, just to show you a bit more work, here's some recent work. We haven't published this yet that, that shows this with in, in, in several different techniques. So here we have two people with their laptops. And you'll see on the side there's these little portals that mo move around. Uh, that shows that there's an opportunity to connect between that. And if I want to actually change information, uh, anyone can initiate that. We simply drag things over to the portal. It appears on the other side, but it's not actually transferred unless the other person drags it out. And that's called something called synchronous gestures, which Ken Hinckley came up with. Um, and so we get this, again, immediate opportunity for information exchange while still having some reasonable security. I can't actually touch your computer. I can just make things available to you. 
Um, in this particular example, we see the same thing on a large display where I now have a portal to a large display, but this time it's immediately put onto it because it's considered public. So the meaning of the display changes. Uh, here we have two people. I can drag something on the, the, other, the large display and, um, and I can drag it back. And both people can do that at the same time, so we can actually populate that display. Another example, we call this drag in and out. And, uh, and here, he's bringing it close to the display. This is similar to what you saw in the earlier video, where we can actually just start transferring items immediately. Uh, but we don't have to have it oriented directly to the display as before. Again, lots of little variations. This is something we call drag between two people. So to exchange information, we have to drag it into the public, uh, public space. Then the other person can put it on their personal device. Um, and we can also have variations of this, which is a bit more permissive, where you're going to see that you can actually drag it directly onto another person's device. But that would have to be more trusted, right? Here's something called point pick and drop, where we just point to something with our actual device it's, and it's transferred to our actual our tablet. And then we can just drop it back on another area. This one's pick edit and drop, so I pick it up, I can edit it on my tablet, and I can drop it back again. Now, again, uh, I think this just kind of exposes a little bit of the richness of possibilities. Uh, but it also shows the value of having a toolkit where it's really easy to rapidly prototype this stuff. Like the guy who did this, Till Ballandot, was actually a fourth year intern who worked in our lab for about six months. So, uh, and this was just something he did on the side. He, I came in one day and said, oh, take a look at this. So uh, that underlying technology, making that simple, is quite important. Now, I, I just want to move direction a little bit and show some other applications of proximity. Um, so one of my MSc students, Mielsen Wang, uh, like we, when he was learning the toolkit, he was kind of given a one-hour tutorial. And then he thought, for his project, he's going to say, well, what can I do with PowerPoint? So here I have PowerPoint. And most of you have used PowerPoint. And one of the issues with PowerPoint is that if you have speaking notes, usually they're on one device, and your presentation is on another. So I'm kind of anchored to this right now. So, and some people have said, well, we can put it on a mobile device, but then I'm trying to squint down on a mobile device. So what can we do if we actually try to apply proxemics to that problem? And this was his solution here. So we're going to see that once it starts playing. Um, so he's giving a presentation, and he's close by. And as soon as he looks toward the display, his notes plus a few controls appear right next to him. So they're close enough that he can read it, he can do whatever he wants. And when he turns back, it disappears. And it actually follows him from where he is. So here it happens on the other side. And he sees his notes. And again, he's advancing the screen. But if he does this at a distance, it doesn't do that because it, the system knows he's too far away to actually read his notes. Now here he's occluding the display, so now it brings up his overview notes so he can just skip across slides very quickly and then come back to the audience. So here the trade-off is how can we actually make the notes and some controls handy while minimizing disruption to the audience. But at least it's all on a single display. And again, this is something he came up with like, like in, a, in a day or two. And uh, because he could rapidly prototype it, he could play with this. Here's another totally different application of uh, proximity. And this is, what, this is by uh, my MSc student, Helen He. And, and I don't have a video of it, but she, she was really interested in sustainability. So she created this, uh, this augmented reality system. So you hold the tablet, there's a camera on it, so you can kind of see through it. And on top of that, she, she adds information. And the way it works is that you, can, uh, you hold it up in your house. And this is actually in her parents' house. Um, where you can actually look to see what rooms are using a lot of energy. In this case, the doorway on the left, which is in red, uh, shows that there's high energy use in there. So in this case, they walk into the room, and now it immediately switches to a device-by-device -device energy view, where you can see the, the kind of the, the hot zones of what's actually using an uh, inappropriate amount of energy there. And as she gets closer to each device, more and more information is revealed. So here, what's actually, even though this was done in a sustainability context, what we're actually doing is semantic zooming as a function of proximity. So in terms of discovering things in our environment, uh, of information about it, this is one possible solution that could be applied to a wide variety of settings. Here's another one. And this also deals with, with large displays, but more from an advertising kind of, uh, kind of view. 
Uh, this is again done by Mielsen Wang. This is actually part of the theme of his MSc project, and this is still work in progress. But the question is, if, if you have an advertising display, your client is actually not the user, it's your advertising, the person doing the advertising. So how do you actually attract the attention of a person walking by without really annoying them? too much. And the problem is, is that they may, you may not get their attention or that you may get it for a bit and they'll look away. So he's, he's, he's trying to look at the nuances of proximity to, uh, of distance and orientation to actually finally control what goes on. So in this scene we see an Amazon type site, we have rapid animation uh, to attract attention as people are walking by, but as soon as they look toward it the animation slows considerably because they're actually investigating it and they want to, to, to allow them to see things of interest. They look away, the animation resumes, um, again because we know that that triggers, uh, triggers our visual attention. They get closer, we get again more detail, in this case we know their identity so it does the usual Amazon thing. Here he's selecting a book, he looks away and we get a little an animation that tries to attract him back again and it does a few other things as he tries, starts backing off. It shows him a few other alternatives and then uh, it tries to say, look, here's even more stuff, don't leave. And then finally it's, he's gone, so it's back to the initial display. This is just a first cut and there's, there's some issues with that. We don't actually have a proper advertising advertiser do it, but here we're really looking at the fine-grained nuances of all stages of the approach and what happens if you start leaving it. Um, so it's not just a zone thing, like what happens is based in part about a history of what they've also done and what the system has done. Um, and of course you can have fun. This is a proxemic pong done by Till Ballandot and he just kind of whipped this up and it immediately starts playing pong. Like you have to have pong in some research project somewhere and uh, it just does the usual connect kind of thing where you can play your game by moving back and forth. But if you move closer it actually goes into a control setting where you can actually change the shape of your paddle. And it pauses the game there. So here he's playing. Um, but he sits down for his break and pauses the game and does that kind of thing. Um, and it also recognizes two players, in which case you immediately have two paddles and the same kind of things hold. The only difference is that the more you play, the more it expects people to move further. So it's kind of like an extra game over time, although you won't see that in, in this video. And uh, some of the same dynamics hold. So uh, perpetual pong. Um, at this point you're thinking, well that's really nice, but gee, this guy Greenberg, he came in and he has this really expensive Vicon setup, which anybody knows about, it costs $100,000 and you can get a cheap one for $25,000 using some other commodity stuff. And yeah, there's connects in there, but it's not really gathering all that information in. You don't have to do this expensively for a lot of this. In fact, a lot of what you can do is simply by how you situate existing equipment. Um, so I just want to, again, kind of revisit this media space thing that's always on vi video. So, so here's my personal situation. I actually live 110 kilometers from the university and I have a video set up between my home office that connects to my work office. And the idea is that students can just drop in my work office anytime to chat to me. Now my work is in the lab, so this, this is the setup here. Connect the home office and the work office of a single telecommuter. That person is in two different places at the same time. It exploits proxemics at both locations to provide awareness and initiate interactions. For example, Saul sees out into the public space, sees when people are coming into his personal space, and can initiate conversations in his intimate space. This is Saul's work office. Saul opens his door from his home in Canmore, 110 kilometers away. He's at both his home and work office at the same time. Just as if he were in his work office, people can see and greet him, and he can see and greet them. People can look into Saul's office to see if he's around, ring his doorbell if they want to attract his attention, or just walk in, and through the normal greeting process, move into conversation. Hi, dude. Come on in. What's happening? Thanks, dude. Come back when you have the new version. See if I'm around. Later. Okay, pretty hokey video, but um, <laughs> I'm known for doing hokey videos. The, you know, the, but the thing about this thing that I, I want to show is that uh, I've been doing media space stuff for ages 
And uh, while we have a few little sensors in here, like we have a servo motor to open the door remotely, we have some sensors to, to notice when people walk into the office, and that's mostly to try to augment people, uh, the attention of what's going on. Really, this system is about how I situate the camera in the space to try to leverage how I can see out and how people can see in. So there, the technology for doing proxemics is pretty well zero. It's just how you, you move things in the environment. And um, so, so again, we have to think about that, that as we create these large displays and other things, the way we actually situate technology can have an impact. And sometimes very, very low fidelity uh, sensing methods can help augment that. Here's another example, again, by, by Mielsen. And uh, again, this is something he whipped up. It's literally 10 lines of code. And the issue he wanted to address was power management for screens. So most of you with screens will either have a little timeout on it. You know, the usual move the mouse. If you don't move the mouse every half hour, your screen will go dark. And he, he thought, well, maybe I could do better than that. So this is totally trivial. And like, as I said, it's literally 10 or 15 lines. He used a fidget. He has a, a range finder sensor that's stuck on top of his monitor with a bit of clay. And, um, and when he leaves, he just turns off the display. You know? And when he comes back, it actually detects his present, and it turns on again. Now, totally trivial. If mass produced, this will probably cost pennies, if that. And think about the power saving that we could have. And to my knowledge, the only commercial vendors that, that do this do this on public displays where there's actually a lot more issues and it doesn't quite work. But I still haven't seen it on any of our, our local displays. And it's kind of a sad statement of, of affairs that there's such fundamental stuff and we still resort to mouse movements uh, to try to infer, is the person actually there? Well, you know, I actually do other stuff than use my computer. Um, how's the time? Okay, still doing good. Um, so I just have a few more things to show you. Um, once you get into this notion of space, there's, also, there's actually a lot of more stuff that you could do. Now, I'm going to just kind of divert a little bit from, from Proxemics to just show you briefly in some, a couple of other projects. Um, we all know these days about touch. And now touch is the big thing. Oh my god, I can touch something. Isn't that incredible? And a few years back, it was all about gestures. Oh, I can wave things. Isn't that incredible? And yet, surprisingly few places have actually merged the two. So one of the things that, in fact, I know it's being worked on, uh, where's Dimitri? Is Dimitri here still? Um, he's over there. Where? There. 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 You know, he's, he's actually looking at Hover. Uh, but, but one of the questions is, what if we actually use that continuous space? What can we do with it? And I'm just going to do this really briefly. Um, here's an example of, of something that happens. You start from touch. In this case, he has an image. He can pick it up. We change the transparency so you can see what's underneath it. But then you can actually uh, move it around uh, through, through rate casting to something that's more distant. So it's actually combining the touch gesture with the space above into a continuous act. There's more stuff on this. Uh, these guys just presented it at, at Interact. But again, if you start thinking about our rich space around us, there's a lot that we can do with it. And here is, is another one. This is done by Anthony Chen. And he actually started thinking about, well, what about people's notion of space around the bodies? So again, these are just toy examples. But here, he's actually uh, thinking about, can I actually anchor stuff on my mobile device to my body? And here, he's just taking pictures that he wants to keep. He bookmarks it onto his forearm. So later on, when he actually wants to get something back again, he just goes to that location, it displays there, and he taps it and he gets it back. Um, and, and if you think about the navigation we're trying to avoid on our small devices, this is what it's really all about. Here he's actually taking things and anchoring it in the space. So he calls this a cobweb. He's pushing this into the space around it. So the space in front of this, he just added this web page. And now he's going to add it to another one to his side. And you know, that's not normally where we push our devices, so it's kind of safe space. Then when somebody comes up and he wants to retrieve something, he just goes back there and he gets it back. And of course, there's a web page, but it could be an application. It could be if I want my email, just go, there it is, and I look at my email. Uh, this particular one, he's actually showing another kind of, of approach, where he's using the space to operationalize the behavior of something, in this case, the schedule. Scheduler. So his hand in front of him, he gets now, but he has his sw sweeps it around, he actually gets different times. So really interesting project, not quite proxemics, but still this notion of using a person's sense of body and the space around them to operationalize an interface. Okay. 
I've kind of talked about my stuff, and I mentioned Dan's, but I also have to say there's a really rich literature in this area, starting with social theory. There's been much more stuff done by people than Hall since, uh, since the 60s. And there's also a lot of people in human-computer interaction who's looked at various um, applications of proxemics. You, typically, they're on one device to another, or a person to, to device, like a person to a large surface, a person to a mobile device or a desktop, attentive user interfaces, how we relate one device to another, and, and in some multi-display environments. Um, our stuff builds upon all this, and I think we are extending it by primarily by looking at this whole ecology of everything together and their interaction between all these things, and also looking at more of those continuous variables about how do we look at the fine-grained nuances of things like distance and orientation of those kind of things. And, and again, it's a great literature. If anybody wants to pursue work in this area, just, just ask, or we'll be happy to share it. But I also want to stress that there's lots of challenges in this area. And first, you know, we're looking at a really high sensing environment. Um, and we all know that that's totally impractical to deploy, deploy that, at least with our current technology. So from a computer science pers perspective, and also electrical engineering perspective, how are we going to develop this sensor technology so our devices actually understand about the relationships to each other? And it's, that's a really tough problem. I know some people are working on it, but I still have yet to see anyone come up with a really good solution, uh, particularly when it comes to fine-grained stuff. I think we're good at getting things like really close together, or we're good at detecting something is in, one, is in a one-meter zone versus another, but we're still pretty bad at doing these fine-grained fine orientation, distance, and those other kinds of things. From a computer science perspective, how are we going to make sense of all the sensory data? Like most of the stuff that comes in is really noisy, and it's you know we have to do sensor fusion, and you know we got to do machine learning to try to find out patterns in this, and it's it's again it's a big challenge in in that area. Um, from a design perspective. Like I've shown you a high sensing environment, but in fact a lot of the stuff that we do can be brought into a low sensing environment. That is, you don't need all these sensors, all this high precision to do that. Like we can actually say, um, well, we've implemented it in this great environment, but actually we can take the main idea and put it into something that we can operationalize today. So there's that whole transference process there. From a human computer interact, or from a, I don't know if I want to call this an AI perspective or an HCI perspective, but there's this whole issue of the rules of behavior. You know, we're creating environments or systems that try to infer our intent based upon what it's sensing, and often that sensing information is inaccurate. And as you see, in some of the videos, you'll probably saw stuff that makes sense. In other ones, you said, oh, I don't really know if I wanted to do that. The one thing I do know is that as soon as we're inferring people's intent, we're going to get it wrong. Sometimes we may get it wrong only 5% of the time sometimes 1% of the time, sometimes 20% of the time, or maybe even 50% of the time, but we will get it wrong. And people often do not like that. So the question is, how do we design these rules of behaviors, but also how do we design interaction techniques so that it tries to mitigate these kinds of problems? And we don't really know how to do that very well. There's, there's a woman, Wendy Ju, from Stanford who's been playing in this area, but uh, we're still trying to come to grips with that. Um, some things that I've seen in the examples, just to give you my own hunch, is that if I approach something and I'm oriented toward it and I get to see more information as I get closer, that seems to make sense because that's what happens in the real world. This idea of discovery, I can see opportunities and discover what I can do as I approach something. To me, that also makes sense and in terms of getting it wrong, there's very little cost to that. Things like, hey, I see you're going away so I'm going to turn myself off or I'm going to do the other thing, that's more suspect and it's much more context and situation dependent. And uh, that's where we have to take care, but it also could be a real sweet spot for AI research and HEI research. And this really does come into this whole HEI proxemics. We really don't understand that. They're like, you know, we have decades of understanding graphical user interfaces on desktop computing. We have a few samples of understanding proxemics and interaction design. And there's also ethics. Um, you know, the whole ethics of having not only high sensing environments, but also how they can be misused. So here's a classic. I just have to up the volume on this a bit, because it's a bit low on, on this. But here's a classic uh, Minority Report excerpt. How many people here have seen Minority Report? So remember when Tom Cruise, John Anderson's walking down the, the shopping center thing? It can tell who he is from, from uh, looking at, at his eyes. And the advertisements here are calling out to him.
So they're, not only are they all calling out his name, they're showing him content that's specific for him. This is kind of like uh, the nightmare approach where everything is clamoring for your attention. Um, and not only that, but, but the system as a whole knows where this person is, which means that it could be used for you know, a whole variety of reasons that's not under your control. In this case, they're trying to find out where he is and, um, and there are the, the, the police discover him. So, you know, we got to really be careful about this stuff. Um, you know, I think one thing that we do as researchers in computer science, especially in interaction design, in fact in every area, is that we have this utopian view of our technology. Like we always think, what's the best we can do with it? And then when it kind of gets out of our hands, often what happens is there's this dystopian thing. Like what is the worst we can do from it? Because we think of our clients, our audience being the end users, but you know, like in advertising, for example, the audience, the, their audience is the advertisers. We're, we're, we're what they deliver. We're the, we're the things that we, give, that, that we give to them. I'm not just trying to pick up on advertising. There's certain lots of areas. So if you're doing work in this area or anything where you look at novel technologies, I think you should, make, you should try to look at both the utopian view, which is great, but also ask yourself, what, how can this be misused? How can it be misapplied? And that's part of our responsibility to actually discuss that with the world around us. And hopefully to put in safeguards. Um, things like this where, again, computer science, security, authentication, all this other stuff, but probably done in a very different way than we do it now. So I started by asking you to imagine this ecology of devices with knowledge of proxemics, this idea of distance, orientation, identity, of nearby people, of, of other devices. I've asked, how can we exploit this knowledge to design user interfaces for embodied interaction? And I think I've shown you some examples, but this really is only the beginning. And my challenge is to you as computer scientists, and for those of you in HEI, as HEI practitioners, is to consider what would you do, what could you design for this future that contains multiple people, interacting devices of all forms, and all this information at your disposal. Thank you. Is the tradition and custom of um, the uh, Sheraton School of Computer Science we present you with this? Whoa! That is so cool. Customize your name. Who, who actually built this? Ah, it's cedar too. It smells great. Thank you. As well as this commemorative mug. Wow! I've always wanted a mug. <laughs> no, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And of course, I have to just show that it's not for show, and I'll hang up my jacket on it because it it's been on the floor. Excellent. And it'll have a nice cedar smell after that. So, uh, we have some time for some questions. We'll get Mark. So, uh, you talked a lot about at the beginning about the idea of box Okay, that, that's a really good question. So essentially we have this theory in sociology which is actually a cultural theory which talks about how people use uh, space and other, at, and, and other information to mediate social, social distance. Um, and you know, one of the things we know from the cultural side is that that even varies between cultures. And can we actually apply that to technology? And um, you know, the, more generally this is actually a challenge that we all face in HEI where there's some theory, be it in psychology or sociology or anthropology, and we want to take that and we say, you know, this sort of makes sense. Can we adapt that to design and to the way we think about devices? And one of the things that I found, and I'm sure Mark, you found this too, is that you can't literally take a theory that's in one field and just, and just plunk it down in another and just expect you don't have to do anything. So the way I think about proxemics is that um, it doesn't apply directly, you know, um, but there's certain things that do apply. So I would say that as a reasonable first order approximation for thinking about design, can we actually use it? <coughs> so, um, and, and I think in some of the examples I've shown you, it does make sense because there's certain expectations we have. Like if I get closer to something, I do expect more reveal, those kind of things. But to, to say that, oh, I'm getting closer to my device, so I'm more in intimate with it, you know, that's, that's a bit absurd. Uh, and we don't think of it that way. 
so, so really, I, I see the proxemic theory as a way to, to reconsider people's expectations of spatial distance in terms of their devices and to design around that. And I think Hall and others have some really good notions in there that we could translate into our application area, not necessarily literally. And often, you know, almost in a caricature kind of way, but it still gives us a lot of value than just doing it blindly. So, and part of what we can actually contribute back to sociology, perhaps, is to actually ask questions of what are people's relationship to their devices and how can we actually talk about that and develop our own theory, or our own proximity of device, people to device, and so on, and, uh, relationships. And that's something that we could do. Oh, I have, let's, let's, let's go with Richard. Well, so other um, so Richard asked, for those of you who didn't hear over there, by the way, Richard came from, was at the University of Calgary, um, and you know, Richard is great. He's a, I gotta tell you this, he's a theory guy, and he was at every HEI seminar, it was fantastic. But okay, that's not the question you're asking. Um, <laughs> but I just have to say that. The, um, a lot of them are prototypes, and they're just meant as envisionments, and they're functional, but they are just that. The actual media space system that you saw, I actually used for two years. And in fact, I just stopped using that about a month and a half ago because I updated to Windows 64-bit and, and, and it broke the connection we have for our video driver and I haven't bothered to reprogram it. Um, it was really important in terms of communicating with my students. What was even more important about it is, is understanding that that system is good at it looked in the video where it totally broke down. So it did what you saw, but one thing that didn't, didn't do well was, was manage audio. So for example, people would come into my office and my voice is over the speakers and they can hear me going blah, blah, blah throughout the lab. I was way too loud, I had no way to modulate my voice. People outside my office were really spooked when it was like six o'clock in the evening and all of a sudden the door opened <laughs> because you know, there was no indication that I was there. Well, I was there virtually, but they didn't know that. So this, so you know, I've only dabbled with some of this, and I actually haven't written this up yet. But um, living in your own technology really gave us a lot of knowledge, not about, not so much about where things work, but more importantly, where things fail, to help us understand, you know, this whole, this whole, whole idea of where do things work, not just with proxemics, but in terms of um, of ubiquitous computing and, and other things. So, um, so with some of it, if you can live in your environment, boy, that practice really helps. If you can employ it, it, it helps even more. But it's sometimes hard to do. Mm -hmm. um, I also know the videos that there are those uh, uh, sphere, white spheres. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how, how far away do you think the technology is from removing these spheres and being able to detect? Okay, um, so, the, so we use two tracking, so the question is really about the sensing environment. So uh, our interest is more in designing the interaction techniques, not in the underlying sensing, because we don't know how to do that well. We, we hope there's other folks who can do that well. So we bought these Viacon systems would do the tracking with the markers. The Connect came out, so we developed our first version of the toolkit that used the trackers. When the Connect came out, uh, Nick, who, who was the main guy behind the toolkit, um, took the Kinect, which is off the shelf commodity item, and he's using that to track people's bodies. So, so all the body position and pointing and other things are, 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 are mostly through the Kinect, but the actual tracking of devices is still through the markers. So how far away are we away from that? I don't know. Like vision techniques are getting better, but they're still quite noisy. Um, and again, there's a certain tolerance for errors. We can actually start putting, um, you know, triangulation methods on some of these devices to try to figure out where they are. Maybe we can have wireless trackers. There's, there's places you can substitute RFID to try to get some information. Right now, it's sort of a mess of techniques and there's no solution. Um, there, there's no obvious one solution. I have a feeling that it may be kind of a fusion kind of setting that will work in part, but, um, when you invent that, let me know. I will buy it from you. <laughs> and there's one in the back. So, so the question is, have you considered the fundamental task or the underlying task that you can do with this? And um, uh, this sort of opens up a can of worms. <coughs> because um, how many of you have taken an intro HEI course? Right, you know, some of you. One of the first things we're, we're taught is, okay, what's a task, you know, 
Um, you know, whether it's task center design or doing personas where you're outlining the tasks that people would, would, would follow and so on. And, and largely, a lot of the classic HCI has been driven by tasks. Uh, one of the things that I think is interesting that's coming up more and more these days is that many of the things that we now do on computers aren't so much task-oriented as they are opportunity-oriented. Whereas there may be a task, there's just opportunities that are created. So, um, you know, we, we go by something, we see something. Well, what's a task? It's is, is really the task is to get somebody drawn into something. So for some of the things here, they are very task-oriented. The ones where we saw, I have stuff on here, and I want to actually get it on there. That's a very clear task. And one of the questions is, well, how do I know? The task is, how do I connect my device to that display? How do I see what's on it? How do I move toward the display? How what's the technique for actually completing that task? How do I know it's been done? That's pretty clear. Things like, gee, I get up and the video stops. Well, is that a task? Well, I don't, I don't know how to describe that a task. It's just more of an operational mechanism. So I think within this, it's, it's, it's you know, part of the challenge is not just to, uh, I would say it's as much to try to understand the opportunities of, for design as it is to actually uh, consider very specific tasks. I think for some of the tasks, and you've seen it through the variety here, um, you could look at a task like the PowerPoint thing and say, well, you know, my task is to see speaking notes. How can I do that using this technique? And sometimes you can do it, sometimes you can't. So I wouldn't necessarily say there's a fixed set of tasks that lend themselves to this. I would say that when, if you are in a task oriented environment, can you actually apply this to this uh, proximity to this in a meaningful way. And for non-task situations, like a lot of ambient displays, those kind of things where you're trying to show opportunities, that presents itself in yet another way. We did.